From its humble beginnings as the world's largest bookstore, Amazon has not only innovated across e-commerce but in adjacent segments within e-commerce. It has also introduced new businesses that seem quite unrelated to e-commerce. Over the years, Amazon has become very good at taking hard problems, often esoteric, and making the solutions easier for the masses to consume. AWS is a great example of that. Now, we have taken something so central and specialized as operating and managing a technology center and pushed it as a commodity, as a utility for the customers to use. And when technology becomes a utility, it becomes ubiquitous and therefore more people can participate in the innovation. There are some things that we do at Amazon that are quite peculiar. Today, I'll talk about working backwards to deliver software at Amazon. So let me begin with a quote from Jeff Bezos. You know, a lot of the innovation here that we do is driven by the idea that it would empower other people to succeed. We're always looking at ways on how we can unleash their creativity so that they can pursue their dreams. AWS is a classic example of that. And our other examples are like fulfillment by Amazon or Kindle Direct Publishing. And in either cases, we are enabling customers to be more successful built upon the platforms that we have been using. Now, a typical classic case that comes to my mind for this case is Airbnb. It was really started by the founders when they were without a job and wanted to earn some extra cash to pay their rent. Literally, that's how it started. Now, it changed the way people travel. More importantly, it changed how people's ability to earn income you know, in certain parts of the world. Um, I was reading a statistics from Airbnb which talks about the economic impact of Airbnb and it says 52% of Airbnb owners are low and moderate income. It also says that 53% are hosting that help them stay in their home. And more importantly, 48% host income is used to pay their expenses like rent and groceries. So this is super important. You know, I mean, um, a few years ago, the entire network of uh, Airbnb, Airbnb was managed by just a handful of guys because they're an all-in customer of AWS and it really simplifies their entire deployment, deploy, uh, DevOps experience. So let's get going and look at more. What is our mission? Well, our mission is very broad. You know, we want to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. What does that mean? Um, you know, it gives us the opportunity that you know, we can take many shape, forms, and sizes. Jeff always says, you know, if you are competitor driven, then you have to wait until a competitor does something. Being customer driven allows us to be more pioneering. But our mission really is rooted in our commitment to make our customer lives easier. I've been an Amazon Prime customer far before I joined Amazon a little over two years ago. The convenience, the selection, the value it provides me as a customer is mind-blowing. The ability that I can return a product if I don't like within 30 days is really, really convenient. And it certainly makes me proud working for a company like Amazon, particularly now that I've been an Amazon Prime customer for such a long year, and I know some of the internal details as well. So how do we do this? You know, where does really the innovation begins? You know, so we really start with the customer and work backwards. And I will elaborate a lot more on that. Uh, Amazon is truly a customer-driven company. We have many leadership principles. One of them is customer obsession. And we really obsess about customers. You know, roughly 90 to 95% of AWS roadmap is driven by customer requests. Uh, we think, uh, we, well, we talk to the customer, first of all, to figure out what they want. And then uh, that is what drives our roadmap. And in certain other cases, we think about what the customer might need, and then we create products based upon that. So we, in either case, we invent on their behalf. So for example, um, none of the customers were asking for Prime, but to begin with, you know, it seems like they did want it. So uh, to begin with in Prime, you could get things in two days, then one day then two hour, then one hour, and pretty soon it will be the case where you would want it before you even order it. So that's an important part of it. Now, Jeff Bezos in 2018 a shareholder letter said, one thing I love about customers is that they are divinely discontent. 
their expectations are never static they always go up and it's human nature this is the biggest advantage of customer centric approach because the customers are the ones that are keeping us honest they are the ones they are the ones who are driving our roadmap um, another quote that i want to give from jeff bezos uh, from the 2016 letter to shareholder is customers always want something better you desire as a company to delight customers and this will drive you to invent on their behalf um so i think that's the key part of having that customer centric approach and that's what pretty much drives you know anything uh, across amazon this is a copy of the letter that was sent as part of, uh, to the shareholders in 1997 um and uh, the part that i want to highlight here is it's amazon uses the internet to create real value for its customers and 1997 internet was quite brand new you know we were not even sure if it will stick around uh, let alone make money using it so um, i wrote my thesis back in 1996 on how to make interactive websites using cgi bin so that's the part that is important to understand that you know we always make long bets we always expect our relationship with customers to outlast us any of us all that's an important aspect um another important term to uh, another important term i want to highlight here is day one every day at amazon is day one uh it means we are only just beginning we are only just scratching the surface so we better keep inventing creating innovating exploring never want to be a day two company um in one of the internal town halls somebody asked uh, jeff that uh, what does day two look like and he says uh day two is stasis followed by irrelevance followed by excruciating painful decline followed by death and that's why at amazon is always day one and this is also quoted by the way in the 2016 shareholders letter so if you want to think about what day two would look like so at amazon this is how we operate this is how we think uh, that we are only scratching the surface at this point of time and will continue to innovate on customers behalf So let's look at what the working backwards process you know look like in a little bit more detail now. Uh this is a picture from uh History Museum in London can I take you back in history how was a uh, development done at Amazon back in around 2001 time frame. Like most of the companies uh, we had a very monolithic architectures means if you want to change one feature in the application the entire application has to be you know rebuild redeployed all of that um is very analogous to that hey i'm driving a car and i just want to change a tire of the car you can do that you got to get a new brand new car now the story goes around at that point of time jeff says you know what hey i want to have this new app being deployed in 3 months you know 3 months went by and then all the team could muster was you know basically provision the hardware and that's around the time you know uh it was like that's not working that's not scaling so even at that point of time we really didn't see ourselves as a book company we saw ourselves as a technology company that hey you know what we are facing this problem of provisioning hardware that is taking about 3 months what can we do about it and have our customers benefit from it so we uh, uh, that's exactly when andy jesse went through the working backwards process you know he wrote some documents and this is where it is you know andy jesse is now the ceo of aws so uh, from the application architecture perspective the main change we did is we took that monolithic application we broke it into multiple microservices and we created something called as a two pizza teams and i'll talk about that in a second but that's sort of the overall thought process here but the main lesson learned over there is you need to decompose for agility and why does it matter actually you know because when the impact of change is small you know release velis- release velocity can increase quite a bit so uh, the finer grain architectures you know what they allow you to do is do one thing and do one thing really well and you can set up you can scale those applications based upon the needs of that application as opposed to bloating the entire application based upon the n- entire needs uh, also the component if you want to componentize the your application Uh, small easily identifiable pieces you know have well defined interfaces they really talk to each other very well and it really the each component really defines a real world use case with service boundaries become the business boundaries and that's how they really talk to each other and the 
cohesive system is really made of all of these small parts really talking to each other. That's sort of the overall architecture here. That's, that's what you want to understand here. Now, let's start with the release process. In the old monolithic model, we have the developers on the left. You know, they were all working out. You know, they were clobbering code, chunking code, you know, putting uh, code in the workspace, um, throwing it over the fence to QA, uh, release and operation teams who then shepherded it out to the production. Um, slow um, and infrequent, you know, because everything, all the changes need to be coordinated, uh, release Tuesdays, release Fridays, or pa merge Mondays, whatever works for you. So we started unbottleneck the process and decompose for agility. You know, as you break up the big functional uh, hierarchies into smaller two pizza teams, and what by what we mean by two pizza team is basically a team good enough that can be fed by two pizzas. Uh, there's always a joke that whether it's an American pizza or a European pizza, but the whole idea is about eight to ten people in a team that can focus on a functionality, that own the entire functionality, and then they deliver the functionality and responsible for maintaining that functionality as well. Now, you have unbottlenecked the development and you have unbottlenecked the architecture, but you still have a release bottleneck. So that's exactly where you, know, you start creating multiple delivery pipelines, one for each service. And this really uh, enables the DevOps uh, to own and manage their own release process. So each team is really managing their DevOps processes. Um, each microservice, as we talk about, is really talking to each other using well-defined interfaces, which are service boundaries or business boundaries as well. So that works out very well. So let's talk a little bit about the two pizza team. Now, what does the two pizza team look like? So, uh, as I said, two pizza team is about eight to eleven people. So hopefully, you know, everybody's taking two slices, and that works out for them. Uh, the service team has full ownership and full accountability. Uh, they're also responsible for you build it, you run it philosophy. So they're responsible for the entire production and production support for the entire application. And what that allows you is because of that high bandwidth communication within the team, they're really operating like a startup. And then they're able to innovate a lot faster within that team itself. So overall, you know, the, our architecture change, Amazon.com architecture change from one big monolith. This is about uh, circa 2009. Uh, now we have lots of microservices, you know, actually thousands of microservices that are talking to each other, and every point in in in, in this is a is a service basically, um, and because of this, we were able to make changes a lot more rapidly. You know, um, and um, as we said, these are the standard microservices principle that we follow, essentially uh, to make the application very ser um, microservices oriented in that sense. So ultimately, we had. Thousands of teams using microservices architecture, doing continuous delivery, which were enabled by continuous delivery. And this allowed us to do 50 million deployments a year. And that is about 100 million, that is about 100 deployments per second, actually. And by the way, this is way back in 2004. So let's look at how do we get there and how working backwards process in a bit detail more now. So uh, what is a working backwards process? Uh, working backwards uh, is an iterative process that takes time. Um, anything and everything that has ever been released at Amazon, including AWS, has gone through this process. Uh, the goal of this process is not to really create a document. That's really an output of your process. Um, uh, as I said earlier, uh, one of the leadership principles and the, one of the most important leadership principles for Amazon is customer obsession. And it says, Leaders start with the customer and work backwards. This is where the working backwards process is really rooted. You know, we start with the customer, uh, what do they need, how will it make their life easier, uh, and then we use that to explore and discover. Uh, what are the key uh, outputs of this process? You know, of course, there is a press release, uh, there is a frequently asked questions, there is a user manual, um, and of course, it is all centered from customer. So before any line of code is written for a product, we take customer at the center, we create a press release, which basically highlights what is the value to the customer, how the press release is, is gonna be done, what the frequently asked questions is gonna be, and I'm gonna dig into more details of each of these artifacts, even a user manual, including some illustrations, etc. okay? So uh, the usual story is 
when you're going through a working backwards process, the press release, the FAQ, the user manual, think of them as a pinata. You know, the harder you hit, the faster you hit, the more the good stuff comes out. So uh, when AWS was created, there was a working backwards process followed, as I said earlier. So there was a press release, FAQ, user manual, all of that that was created you know, um, as part of that process. Let's dig more into it. Of course, um, the most important question is, who is your customer? You need to really identify your customer and um, because they are the foundation for what we call as a PR FAQ. The common terminology you will see is, uh, we generally would say it a little faster, like PR FAQ. So that's the terminology, okay? So um, for example, uh, when uh, Echo was announced, okay? Or, or rather, um, not Echo, uh, Kindle. When Kindle was announced, uh, the PR FAQ for Kindle really said, our top design principle was for Kindle to disappear in your hands, to get out of the way so that you can enjoy reading. As a result, the first Kindle when it was released and it was sold out in five and a half hours. It had wireless capability, so you can read in bed or train, um, and it had um, 101 out of 112 New York Times bestsellers. Now, think about you know, the vision that we had from the PRFAQ perspective and the implementation. It really leaves a lot of space on how the implementation is done because that's the top level vision, customer centric vision that is there in you. Now, in this slide particularly, if you think about uh, this woman, maybe you know, if she's our customer, then she is traveling on the bus. Maybe she does not want to use voice to interact. Uh, perhaps she is traveling through a part of the town that has poor connectivity. You know, we all have times when signals break out. So we need to recognize on what that customer interaction is gonna look like. Um, how are the needs of customer in other countries different from your own? If your customer, if your product is gonna be used internationally, um, uh, do they have fast, reliable internet access? You know, uh, how can you design and build an idea in a way that delight customers? So always put customer at the focus, okay? One of the key customers for AWS was startups where they don't have the bandwidth or the time to spend resources in setting up a data center. And that's where you know, we have these programs where we encourage startups to participate in our program and we give them free credits to get started as well. As part of the PRFAQ process, uh, there are five questions that are typically asked and those five questions are listed over here. Uh, the first and the f first and foremost, you have to identify who is the customer. This is the most important cost customer that gives you the context that uh, really empathize with the customer. Then uh, what is the customer problem or opportunity? You know, you're going to understand that part of it. Um, it is, um, it is the most important customer benefit clear. Is it value? Is it selection? Is it convenience? It is trust. And this is where exactly you need to be absolutely clear because that clarity is what allows you to focus and prioritize. And this is where we often have a lot of detailed discussions on what that value is to the customer. How do you know what the customers really want um, or the need? You know, we need qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis for that. And then last but not the least, what does the customer experience look like? That's where you will actually have visuals, paint a picture on what that entire experience looks like. So, um, yeah, for example, as we were talking earlier about Echo. So the Echo PRFAQ document talks about interacting with a voice assistant uh, that people can communicate while cooking in the kitchen. That was the requirement essentially. Uh, working in the garage, walking around the room. Um, so it, that's kind of the idea that you know we talk about. You know, you're identifying the customers, their surroundings, and then because the vision is broad, that allows you to implement it in a variety of ways. And of course, I use um, uh, Echo on my day um, on my daily basis, and my family loves it. Now uh, the what are the core artifacts that come out of the working backwards process? So of course there is a press release, which basically highlights exactly how it's gonna look like. Then there is a frequently uh, set of uh, questions that are, that are gonna be listed over there. And then there are visuals in terms of what the user flow is gonna look like. So um, several key artifacts that come out of that entire process. Um, the whole working backwards process is to get clarity. Process um, to, is to get the focus and to have true customer focus. That is the fundamental part of it, okay? So uh, 
what you need to do, you need to think big. You need to imagine the perfect state, imagine telling customers for the first time about what you have created. That's exactly what goes in a press release. You really have to put it in a customer-centric language. Use simple, concrete words. Now, uh, the focus is to not put any insider jargon or acronyms, okay? That's a key part of it. And in the FAQ, again, we put a lot of examples. There is an internal FAQ and an external FAQ. How much does it cost? When is it available? Can we ship it sooner? Who else is doing this? So, and we classify them in an internal and external FAQ. So, all, and these documents could run long, typically. Um, so, uh, the true purpose of working backward documents is really a conversation starter. You know, it's, you know, you discuss the document, you debate the document, you ask all sorts of questions. Um, can we do this? Can we make it bigger? Is this the right solution? Multiple iterations go through it. 30, 40, 50 iterations is very common for any uh, working backwards documents because it's a living document. You're constantly reviewing it from a customer focus. Um, and we call the process as crafting the document. You know, we pound it, we shred it, we critique it. You know, all, all sorts of comments, you know, that go in there. Um, so again, as I said, it's like a pinata. Hit it hard, hit it hard. The harder you hit, the faster it comes out. Um, uh, go back to the echo PR, PR FAQ thing that we were talking about. It says, one of the uh, lines uh, in there said that, you need to have a voice controlled internet connected home audio system that uses natural voice to play music and read books, weather forecast and more. Uh, it also talks about order olive oil while cooking. That's the customer use case right there itself. So think about you know, how this working backwards document is really helping you solve the customer problem. At Amazon, we also offer a working backwards workshop. So talk to your Amazon account rep and learn you know, how you can do something similar for yourself as well. We also uh, enable um, uh, teams at Amazon to um, experiment a lot, prototype and iterate a lot. Uh, and experiment means a lot of failures. And Jeff Bezos actually said that Amazon is the best place to fail. So you want to take action quickly. You want to lower the cost of failure. That's the important part of it, okay? So we have a very specific way of doing this. And, and the way we do that is, is basically making a fundamental decision about the type of decision, okay? So we have this concept of a one-way and a two-way door. And we get asked these questions all the time as we are reviewing the narratives, as we are reviewing the press release or the FAQs. Um, now, when we have a decision to make, we, the first thing we do is determine what kind of a decision is this? One way door is where you walk out of the door and you cannot walk back in. And two way door is where you can walk out. If you don't like it, you can walk back in. So one way doors uh, have significant and irrevocable consequences and need deep analysis. So we spend significant amount of time on those. Two way doors are where we have limited and reversible consequences and uh, we have a reason that we believe that it might be a good, and if we don't like it, then we can always reverse it. So the common pitfalls of the large organizations is one size fits all decision making, and that makes every decision making process as slow um, and methodical, even for two-way doors. And at Amazon, when we are writing these narratives, we quickly talk about in a narrative, this is a one-way door or a two-way door. Two-way door, you move up and you, know, you move on actually. And one-way door is where we spend time on this. So the PRFAQ essentially acts as a beacon. It acts as a guiding light all throughout the process. The product team can ask themselves you know, throughout the process as they are building the product, are we building what is in the press release? Uh, if, this, if they are spending time building something that is not in the press release or over-engineering it or over-building it, then they need to ask themselves why. Why are we deviating from what we originally agreed upon? This really keeps the product development very focused on what was originally agreed upon. Now the needs do change, but then again, that needs to be kind of talked about. So uh, Jeff said uh, in an interview that when you have to write your ideas in complete sentences and complete paragraphs, it forces a deeper clarity of thinking. You know? So by contrast, in PPT, you get very little information, you get bullet points, and a lot of context is actually provided by the presenter, you know, and a lot of things goes into the speaker notes itself. Um, and uh, now it's been over two years that I've been working at Amazon. I fundamentally believe that the process, the way we 
uh, we have been following so far outside Amazon is the one that actually worked backwards as well. So I fully agree with Jeff in that sense. So let's do a quick summary on how Amazon does product development or how Amazon does DevOps. Okay. So uh, first of all, we decompose for agility. You know, we uh, highly um, the e we, we follow the concept of a two pizza team where the team has full ownership, uh, where they have you know the communication going very well within the team, where they clearly define service boundaries all there. We automate everything so that it goes through the deployment pipelines. We have standardized tools across all the teams. Uh, there are governance templates, you know, all sorts of you know belts and suspenders available so that you know your things stay in shape, and everything is written as infrastructure as, as a code. And before we even get to that, the important part is that working backwards process, which basically guides us towards the product development over here. So uh, I hope you find this information useful. Um, look for uh, some of this information. There are some recordings of this available in different shapes and forms. And if you want to do the working backwards workshop with Amazon, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you.